Uh, Jesus didn't have a problem with people that's in the streets. He had a problem with religious people. How can I help anybody when I'm not even when I was not even able to help my own son? I would never do that. I would never do that. And I became that in a matter of minutes when they took my pain pills away. And I said, I'm not where I want to be. But thank God I'm not what I used to be. Ugh. This is Faith in Your Recovery. I am Randy Davis. Welcome to the battle. At Faith in Your Recovery, we believe that together we overcome, and we want to be a part of your team. We want to be a part of your village. We want to be a part of your recovery and a part of your battle. We know you're the one who has to put up the fight, but we're going to fight with you, and we're going to fight for you. So when you feel like the world's given up, understand, we're behind you. And we're going to prove it here today. We've got a guest, Mr. R.J. Pittman. Welcome, R.J. Hey, thank you for having me. We're anxious to hear what you have to share with us. I know you've been there, done that. You've got scars to prove it. You're living above it now. But I knew you had to live with it for a while, yes? Oh, absolutely. It was, um, you know, childhoods are all, well, addiction's always different for everybody. So I'm sure I'll have something new to share. Yeah, and that's the neat part about this. We want to be about all things recovery. And we know we've got to take kind of a throwing the rice approach instead of throwing the rock. <laughs> and uh, you're a piece of the rice hey. today in a, in a very good way. Hey, okay, man. yeah, yeah. So let's go. No, uh, tell them right now who RJ is, what he's about. You don't have to go deep into that. We'll come back to it in the end. Before we get to your story, tell them who RJ is today. So today, you know, I, um, I've i actually owned my own for-profit business. Um, it's called Recovery Painting and Remodeling, hence the word recovery. Um, so I try to work closely with our court systems and hiring people that need second chance and getting employment. Um, people that's either in active addiction trying to find recovery or in recovery trying to stay out of active addiction. Um, I also have a n nonprofit that isn't registered yet with the federal, but we're getting there. You know, we're it's a slow process, as you know. You bet. Um, so, but and that's the same thing. We help people in there, you know, that's in recovery stay there, and um, we throw events. Um, you've been down to those before, so um, we have people come in from all around the country, give testimonials, play music. Some big name speakers, and uh, you know, in the field of recovery, these are names that are recognized yeah so we've had joe nestor in um he's huge in the recovery um joe has played for us now two years in a row we have him lined up to play on the third year this year um we have chaz smith his name's uh Kalichi, which i think everybody out there in the recovery world knows um we've had him both years as well and then of course um b rain rim one and then some of our speakers are chicago hope dealers they've came in this year and helped out minnesota hope dealers was there this year um from yeah. dope dealers to hope dealers from dope dealers thing, to right? hope dealers yeah so it says slinging dope now we're slinging hope right and that's why <laughs> we're here today because we believe your story is going to give people hope as well because more than one's going to be able to identify and if nothing else more than one's going to be able to understand something when we're done that they didn't understand before absolutely and that's what it's about it's touching one person you know that'll be the victory so let's go back to your early days let's talk about rj as a young person tell us what you were about what you know what was it that that fired you up for life during that time well so like you know like i said in the beginning addiction comes in and walks many walks of life you know um mine was a little different than what some of the people prior to us and that that is because i i grew up in a decent household um you know my dad and my mom split up at a young age but however my stepdad stepped up and played that dad role for many years and so i i had a really good childhood and um, all the way until I was about 12 years old till I started doing self-destruction, you know, and that wasn't because of any parenting. Um, but unfortunately, I didn't have that, that father figure there. Um, I do now, which is great, and my dad's sober now. And uh, so it, the walk of life that I had is beginning, and then the walk of life that we're going to talk about in my active, active addiction is complete 180. And, it, and it's... Um, just goes to show that anybody can end up into this 
disease, yes. you know, and it's unfortunately, but also anybody can get out of that disease. And that's why we're here. Addicts do re- hashtag addicts do recover. <laughs> so I think I caught you saying that the demise started like 12 years of age, yeah. that uh, the struggle began. Share that with us. Yeah. So um, I was very active in sports when I grew up and um, I, I like to play football, baseball, basketball, any sport. And it didn't matter if they overlapped into school. I played them, you know, both. And luckily I had my mom, my stepdad that backed that up and um, put in probably 12 extra hours a day on top of their 12 hours of work to, to be there. But um, with that, though, requires me to have that energy to do that, too. And um, I started off with smoking marijuana. I think a lot of people can say that and relate to that. Um, but this was in your junior this high This is when years? I was 12, yeah. Yeah, um, but sixth, seventh grade. Very quickly, though, it turned into um, cocaine use, and that was to be able to keep me active and keep going. But, you know. How, um, how old were you when it kicked into cocaine? 14. How were you able to to get that cocaine? How did you find it? What got you moving from the you know, marijuana yeah. to the cocaine. Well, so, um, like I said, so I was in very active in sports. Well, along with that, was a lot of people were also very active in sports. So a lot of the people that I hung out with had that access to um, that drug at that time. And and back then, we didn't have the, um, the, the random drug screens at the schools like they do now in place. And so it's very easy to skid by and not have to worry about getting caught doing these things. And so um, I, that's what I did. I got active into it when I was 14, and um, that helped me keep going with lifting weights and uh, doing the things that I needed to do to stay active into the sports. Unfortunately, that changed because of that active addiction. Um, you know, my thought process was, is I'll just do this until I get through school, and then I'll be done with it. Well, as, a, as an addict with the disease that I carry, that's not feasible, as we all know. You know, you know it now. You didn't know it Did then. not know that I'm then. I'm <laughs> sure you didn't have any idea it was a disease. It was a total, it's cool, let's do it kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, and, you know, back then, um, I don't think that anybody re- recognized active addiction and, and it, as it being a disease. You know, it it was a form of, it's a choice in that you can either quit or you don't have to quit it. And um, so now we can relate to it a little bit more and we got groups like you know uh, brianna's hope which we'll get into with me later but uh then it wasn't like that you know they had naaa and that was your choices and um so the court system didn't see addiction as a disease the the school systems didn't see that and we didn't know it because we wasn't educated on it so um if i was to look back and say hey i wish i could do this again I would definitely do that. <laughs> definitely do what? Step away from I it? would definitely you step away and gotcha. go in a different direction. Because, you know, at, at 14, I started doing the, the cocaine. At 16, I decided, well, this is too much. I got to drop out of school. And, you know, so uh, it was either I, I gave my mom an ultimatum. Either you go sign the paperwork for me to drop out of school, or you're going to go to jail for neglect because I'm not going. You're not going. You know, and so... And, and that's unfortunate, you know, and um, I don't laugh about it as in, you know, I put her up to that and it was, you know, that was uh, a good thing for me to do. But looking back, I could say that I wish that I would have never dropped out and I wish she would have just said, no, I'm not signing that paper, you know, because um, it, two years later, I ended up in jail and I was on my 18th birthday. So in a matter of six years, I went from very active in sports, playing quarterback and being the the highlight of the football team or, you know, per se, to sitting in a jail cell, you know, and it was that quick. The It's not a stumble sometimes. It's a total fall, yeah. isn't it? There's nothing gradual. It goes in a hurry. Right. You know, we talk about six years. As you look ahead six years, it, it seems like a long time. Look back six years, that was yesterday. Absolutely. And that was a major part of your your life at that time you're 18 you know six years of that that's one yeah. third of your life during that was spent in that struggle in that battle i know it didn't end there we'll talk more about that in yeah. a minute 
but that is evidently where that deep sea of darkness was planted. Right. And unfortunately, I missed most of my childhood because of that, you know, um, because I was so worried about getting high and knowing that I can go lift weights or go play football if I did this drug um, that I missed so much of my childhood. And so I never even got to be a kid. So maybe that's kind of why I act like a kid sometimes now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll use that excuse anyhow, okay, until we find out differently. So on your 18th birthday, you're in jail. Was that your first incarceration? Yes, it was. So um, I had been in residential at the age of 16 after I dropped out of school, but it wasn't for um, any criminal charges. It was just being out past curfew um, several times. And so I got placed into residential, but my first incarceration was on my 18th birthday, um, 1998. And, uh, I had, was facing 16 class A misdemeanors, you know, and all that was ranging from the time that I started using cocaine at 14 and could actively, um, get a checking account at 16 and started using that to supply my habit. You know, and so at 18, I now had to face these criminal charges and ended up in the system that I'm still fighting to get out of today. So what was the length of the charges at that point? How much time were you sentenced to? So I got I got really um, I I would say back then I felt like I got real lucky. If I look back now, I wish it would have been a little more harsh of a punishment and maybe I could have, you know, caught it. But back then I looked at it, it was, um, I got lucky. I ended up with 90 days house arrest, paying the restitution off. Um, so I, I, I got a slap on the hand. Pretty you much know? so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it didn't, I didn't learn anything from it. It didn't the get your attention because the consequence for that choice wasn't that dynamic. No, so, I spent a night in know. jail and then was out, you know, and so what can you learn by that is not much, yeah, you know. Yeah. Okay, let's move on from there on into those, those you know, early 20s, those mid-20s. Tell us about that. Yeah, so unfortunately, uh, like I said, that, that I didn't learn nothing from that mistake. And I ended up, um, a couple years later, I caught a dealing case and... So I went on the run prior to I'd gotten tipped off that they were going to raid my home. Um, I went on the run and I was out of state for about a year and I decided that I was tired and I wanted to come back and just turn myself in. So I came back and unfortunately I did not go turn myself in. Um, so at the age of 20, I was facing um, several felony charges ranging from forgery all the way to class B felony burglaries out of two different counties. And um, so I was looking at a substantial amount of time. Uh, un and unfortunately I sat in jail and didn't get anything from it. And I just sat there and thought, you know, like we always do is, God, if you just let me out of here, I won't ever do it again. I promise that you. That bargaining, <laughs> yes, yes. You know, and and now, now that I, you know, have learned what I've learned in recovery and in my faith, I know that that um, definitely wasn't the reason why I ended up going home anytime soon, because God doesn't bargain with you. Um, but so I ended up in prison. I, I did go to prison for uh, about six years. And that I, was over these charges? Over those charges there. Yeah. Um, and I took a substance abuse class there. And unfortunately, their substance abuse class at that time was basically you was only there for a time cut. They weren't really there to teach you anything um, because they weren't as educated as they are now either, you know. And so um, trying to learn how to get out and stay actively in recovery was next to none. You wasn't finding it there. And, and unfortunately, you can find drugs there just as easy as you could on the street too. So um, I was using the whole time I was incarcerated. So when I came out, I was I was still in active use. I wasn't it even was, in recovery. It wasn't any kind of rehab. It no. was just being removed from quote unquote society as a whole. Right. No benefit in the sense of at least how it worked in you and for you, right? Right. There was nothing that, that I learned from it, if I could say that. like. Um, nothing positive I learned from okay. it. 
learned a lot of negative things Absolutely. while being incarcerated. And I found a lot more, um, quote unquote hookups while I was incarcerated. Um, so unfortunately what that ended up leading to is me getting out. And of course I was still in active use, so I didn't last very long on the streets. I ended up, uh, right back in for violations for dirty drug screens and, um, went right back to prison. And so, and that, that was the majority of my whole 20 twenties from the time I turned 20 until the time I turned 30 is I was in and out, in and out, in and out. And it went on even past that, but I lost my whole twenties to the penitentiary. Were, was there any kind of, I'm tired of this. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired yet. Oh yeah. You, yeah. I mean, you Was get to that. Utility? Yeah. And, um, you know, you're so sick and tired of it when you're incarcerated. It's just when you come back out, then that sick and tired, you, you seem to forget that what the incarceration was and how awful it was in there and you're you right back sick and tired of the drug you were sick and tired of incarceration yeah, yeah. but uh, until you change the root of what sent you there <laughs> there won't be any change right yeah exactly and that, that that ended up being the problem for you know for several years there through my 20s is that i just wasn't ready to i wasn't ready to quit and if you're not ready to quit you're not just you're not going to be able to do it you yeah, know yeah and and i know that i've heard many podcasts through the, our faith and recovery that, that explains the fact that we have to be ready and if we're not ready it's going to be really hard for you to be able to obtain recovery and keep that recovery and there's no clue for us to be able to push that button so you will be ready right got to come from within you and just like the journey the button's different on everyone yeah? right yeah it's not like the best buy commercials where you can hit that easy button or... don't you wish <laughs> uh, we all do so you said during your 20s you had all that struggle the time in jail in prison you'd already talked about six years of your teen life Mm -hmm. So actually up to the age of 30, it was the majority of your life was bound to the drug that was binding you. Well, I mean, even past that, you know, but um, luckily in my 30s, I, you know, I, I found recovery. I'd be there for six months or a year and then I would fall back in, you know, and um, I hear people use the word fa you failed, you know, you failed this time, but you can get back up. And I never use that word because failure is so permanent, you know, and to me. And so I stumbled and I had those stumblings all the way through until I got clean, which was, um, you know, September 29th, three years ago. And so, and I'm 41 today, you know, so, I mean, it, it took my whole life, you know, but I, I still have a lot of life left in this recovery. We hope so. <laughs> we sure hope so. You're talking about the word failure and how that's not a part of your vocabulary when it comes to your recovery, though there are those who want to use that. I want to liken that to this. I hear somebody say I'm 200 days clean, whatever the number may be. You hear from them a little while later, well, I relapsed. Now I've got to start over. I don't believe you've got no. to start over. I've always said if if you lose 35 pounds and gain back 15, you're still 20 pounds ahead of the game. Yeah. Uh, I realize that may be a weak illustration, but numerically to me, no, you may have lost that day or that moment, but it's up to you whether you've got to go back and start over or work from where you were. You've got new tools now. Yeah, and, you know, yeah. here's the thing is is how can you lose that two years? You gain that two that's years. That's your exactly. two years that you worked for. That's the two years that you fought for. Those two years didn't go away. Absolutely. You know? So Absolutely. I, I agree with that. I, I totally agree with that. And I know there's going to be a lot of people that's going to be controversial now, about that's that. That's cool. But everybody has their own opinion. Exactly. You know, just so. like that journey, okay? And we're not <laughs> trying to convince you, but we're letting you know all things recovery. There are different options. So it was in your 30s, you said, that you started to get serious and start to look at recovery, start to experience some recovery movements, groups, whatever. Mm -hmm. Talk to that a little bit to help folks understand. So I never really found... Um, a uh, meeting that worked for me and i always so what i always ended up doing was um you know i would 
try to do this on my own. And uh, as we all know, doing it on your own, some the majority of the time, I won't say all the time, because you know there is some people that that slides by on that, but. Um, it's just not feasible. And, and, and you know, like, uh, Dr. Phil would say, how's that working for you? And usually it's not working well. Yeah. And, and so that's, that's the reason why I kept having those stumbling blocks, you know, is because I would try to do it on my own and, um, learning and looking back now and knowing that you can't do this on your own is, I, I wish I could have learned that at 30 years old, you know, and, um, I wish I could have found a Brianna's Hope at 30 years old. Uh, but there wasn't meetings like that. You know, there was um, Reformers Unanimous didn't start until several years after that. Um, you know. Uh, you had some celebrate there, recovery. There was some CRs, but yeah. they weren't that big then. Yes. And um, so it was like I, I couldn't find. And I grew up when I when I was younger to just kind of throw back was, um, I, I grew up going to church with my mom and my grandmother, you know, so I went to a Methodist church in Muncie, Indiana, um, whose church is really huge now, but I went to that church for several years. So that seed was planted, you know, uh, as a child. So I knew that the only thing that was going to work for me was some kind of faith-based recovery group if I was ever going to get clean, but unfortunately they weren't there. So uh, I ended up just keep falling back into the same, the same pattern of um, addiction and jail and prison and probation and um, all the way up until three three and a half years ago when I landed into the jail and said God I'm done you know do to me is whatever you need to do with this jail sentence I don't really care but I'm not going back out to this you know um, and a lot of that was in my 30s uh, I lost my mom and you know uh, to I want to say it was drug inducer related um and she was in active use and uh so i i didn't and then you know my dad got clean and he's doing very well and I, my brother was in prison and um it all of us were gone to this life of addiction and it was like uh our Pittman family was going to go away eventually either by death or prison and there our name was going to die out, you know? And so I made a pack, like I'm getting clean. I'm going to stay clean and I'm going to do whatever I can to help somebody else stay clean. Here's the difference I hear in what you just told us versus the bargaining from before you <laughs> went from bargaining to surrender. Yes. Uh, not what someone else can do for you. And that's someone else being God, but I am done being me and I am going to be the me God created me to be. Right. Those weren't your words, obviously, but those were your thoughts, I believe. Well, and you know, the thing about it, God is, is that God has a plan for us, and um, he never veers from that plan from the day that he He knows that we're going to be made till the day that we go home to him, right? And so, like I said, that seed was planted in me, and... Uh, I just knew that I had to get back to there and God gives us that free will and that free will landed me into several years of prison yes. and jails and probation, which is where it goes back to, I can't do this myself. So I had to surrender and that's my higher power. And I hope that whoever hears this understands that your higher power can be God if that's what your choice is or whatever, but you got to find something to make your higher to power move you to that next <laughs> level and ultimately i think it's got to be god but that's okay too that's just so, that, and that's our yeah. you know that's our belief and um you know just like that every wednesday when i open a meeting up for our brianna's hope i tell everybody we're faith-based but we're not going to push that on you because we want you to come as you are and we want you to we want to love you for who you are you know and so we hope that you get something that comes from our faith but we we just want you to be here. To we know. accept you as you are, just as Christ does. So, yeah. okay, uh, you found that Brianna's Hope connection and that worked for you with your yeah. faith background. 
So the struggles were suddenly over, right? You found what you <laughs> needed. There was no more temptation, no more thought of relapse. Everything worked perfect. No flat tires on your car. No issues at work, yeah? I don't know who you've been talking to. but <laughs> oh, no. I, I uh, thought it, uh, recovery was just easy, easy peasy uh, road. Let me just tell you that recovery is just as hard or harder than your addiction was. And the reason why I say that is because uh, we have to work hard at this. And we have to do, we have to work hard at this recovery every single waking moment that we have. And uh, you're always going to find something that is, uh, has that temptation or something that reflects back to your active use and what you did in your active use. You know, whether it be um, just smoke a cigarette after you eat dinner, you know, which is what a lot of people do because that's a form hab a habit form. Well, that's the same with drugs. You know, um, every morning when I would wake up, that was the time that I made sure I had something ready to use so that way I could get out of bed. And so I had to learn that I didn't need that every morning. And then I had to learn I didn't need that every afternoon. And what did you fill that with? So I, I filled that with, honestly, I filled it with um, devotionals there at the beginning. And I, I, and that's how I did it. So whenever I woke up, I had a devotional or I had a um, inspirational saying that I'd say out loud, you know, um, and, uh, ask, what's it called? Um, affirmation, Yes. you know, and I would just say, hey, I can do this today. I can do this today. Um, and I was very lucky. I had a great support system in place. You know, um, when I first came into recovery, uh, Pastor Amy of our recovery group down in Decatur uh, just open armed me and said, hey, come on, I got you, you know, and she had never been a person of active use, but she understood it and she wanted to love us for who we were. And so I found her, then I found our drug court system, or team that was in place down there, um, our probation officers that were in place down there that are like people, regular people. And when we're in our active use and we're in and out of jails and prisons, probation are, uh, people are act or, uh, actual people. They're, you know, they're, they're somebody different, you know, they're law enforcement. Um, but this probation department wasn't. And, you know, um, they supported us for who we were. This was a community of people helping yes. a community of people supporting to where you broke down that stigma from both sides. Yeah. The stigma of the individual who's using that one who's struggling with addiction and the way they feel about law enforcement and the court system. And the same from that side, they could view you as real people right. with an issue, with a disease, with a with a challenge. And it wasn't the idea of who was going to win, but how can we all win? Yeah, and that's what it was. Like, it wasn't, um, hey, when's he going to mess up so we can get him back in jail? It wasn't, um, we're going to win this, you know, or we're going to, it wasn't nothing like that. Like you just said, it, it was how can we make you a better person? How can we make you succeed in life? And I love that. I had to, I, I say I had the best probation officer and case manager in the world um, when I had Danielle Taylor. And what she did for me was just amazing. I mean, she went to the college and toured the college with me. And she would go to um, appointments, doctor's appointments, and set with me because my fiance would be working or, you know, whatever the case may be. Like, she made it a point that she was going to be there to support me outside of any paycheck that she would receive from the county. And uh, so just, she didn't just, how do I want to say this? She was involved in your life, not just your addiction struggle. Absolutely. She was with you and for you instead of talking about you from a distance. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. and that, and that's and you f you find that with any of them up there, you know. Um, and I, at that time, I didn't know that because I only knew her, you know. And I, you build this trust with them. And I've never been able to do that in all the years that I've been on probation and, you know, all through my 20s, my 30s. I could not form a trust. Matter of fact, um, years ago, I had a probation officer that told me I would never be anybody and I would die from this disease, you know, and that come from a probation officer. So I didn't have any reason to trust 
any of these people. You had seen nothing positive. So. Nothing, you know, and so, and I, but I openly told her that from day one that I walked in her office, I will never trust you. I don't expect you to trust me. I'm a drug addict in your eyes. It's never going to make it. And I think that that stuck with her and she made me out to be a liar, you know, and I'm okay with that. Right. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Uh, but in the, in the time frame of that, I met my fiance and, you know, I met Tara and we were on this same path as one another. Like, you know, she was on this path that she was going to be in recovery the rest of her life and she was going to help people. And I was on the same path of forming Get Sober, Stay Sober and being in Brianna's Hope and helping people. And uh, so it was just a click, you know, and it was right out the gate. We learned that God has a soulmate for everybody, you know, like you and Rose, you know, and um, this was mine. And so we started dating and she avenues recovery center opened up in Fort Wayne and I had toured it with Travis, you know, a friend of mine. And, uh, I knew that they needed help. So I told Tara about it and she's like, I can't do this job. Like, um, and I forced her into going up there and, uh, to today, you know, she thanks me because she's now been there for almost two years. And she's, we want to get her in here. Oh yeah. Her she, story. yeah. So leave I don't want to get into her too much, yeah, but don't my, my point behind that is, um, you know, I found my support within her and everyday support in her, you know, and, um, so we ended up now, now we're on this journey together and she's doing what she's doing. And, um, I, like you said, I won't go into too much detail, but so she got her case manager or probation officer at the same office that I had. And she's, we're telling each other stories about these two officers and they're just alike, right? They just, they both want us to succeed. So this whole probation department has formed into nothing but let's get these guys to succeed and their success rate up, you know, and everybody wins. That's, you know, you know, it takes a village. Forget the politics with yeah. that statement. I could care less about that, but it does take a village. Uh, yeah, we've got to have people on our side, and we've got to have people who challenge us as well when. You know, when we need to be held accountable, or we need to look in the mirror. We need someone who cares enough to say, hey, step back, go take a look, and let's try it again. So, all right, we've got you up to that point in your life. What, are there any, I'm not even sure how to ask this, any concerns about your past that cause you fears today or are you at a point to where you've come to a peace to where you know you can continue to move forward? Temptations, I know the temptation will always be there. It can be one and done, one and fall completely. But, uh, yeah, speak to that. Yeah, I mean, um, one thing I could say is don't ever get comfortable, you know. and, and That's th what I'm after. It came to a point where I, I did. And, you know, I um, probably about... Well, I mean, we mean you've talked outside of here. So I would say six months to eight months ago, I got really comfortable in my recovery a year ago. I got real comfortable in it and I didn't fall back into using drugs. Um, un and fortunately I didn't, unfortunately though, I fell back into old habits that would relate back to that. Right. Behaviors and from behaviors. the addiction. Yes. And, yes. Um, so Luckily, I had a gentleman named Randy Davis that would put me in check on a, about a weekly day or a weekly basis. And my fiance, of course, you know, and um, luckily by that happening and those people reaching out to me, I nicked that before it got to the point of relapse or um, prison again or, you know, um, things like that. And. So there's always going to be temptations. There's always going to be things that come in front of us that are going to relate back to that old life because we can't sit and say that that whole old life of active addiction was horrible because we always have our moments of laughter and, you know, things that happen in there. But 
have that support system in place because when those things do happen, if I wouldn't have had my support system in place, I wouldn't be sitting here with you today. Yeah, yeah. I remember you and I standing, and I can take you back and almost put your feet where they were, my feet where they <laughs> were, and looking at you and saying something about you being in the self-sabotage. Yeah. And I also you remember your answer with just that little, that little chuckle and the comment that, yeah, that's what happens in addiction. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that was a, a kind of a come to Jesus moment for <laughs> both of us. All right. Okay. Take us on from there. Tell us now. Start bringing us, you know, yeah, you've been fighting up the hill. Let's stand on the hilltop. Tell folks how life is. We, we've tried to make it clear addicts do recover. Explain recovery to them as you are experiencing it. So one thing that I think we always have to recognize is we have what we call quote unquote haters, people that are going to, that are going to think that we're never going to make it in life or um, that we are hiding things or doing this or doing that. And what we have to do is be able to recognize it as what it is and put that to the side. And I, I run into that a lot, you know, um, because of the fact that I did go into self-sabotage moment. And so that one little spurt of self-sabotage moment is something I'll probably live with for a few years, you know, and that's fine. I'm okay with that. Uh, but so it's nothing's going to be perfect. And I don't stand on this hill. Um, I know you want to say I stand on this high top hill and I'm looking down at everything that I've done. I'll never reach that high top hill, right? Because um, I'm going to work on this every single day of my life, the rest of my life. This this is a this is like cancer. This this disease is not going to ever go away. But one thing I can do is put it in remission, and I, that's what I've done. And I that's by my my faith in God and allowing Him to come in my life. I've been able to put that in remission. Um, but today, you know. Um, I'm very ill. My my medical is not the greatest, but I didn't let that get me down either. And and you know I made a Facebook post a while just a few weeks ago that said, you know the doctor used that C word whenever I was there, and um, but I didn't let that go. I didn't let it get me down. I still go to my meetings. I still say God's got this, and God's gonna make this go away he's going to make that c word go away and whether it's go home with him and not have any pain or set here on this earth and continue to help people god's got this man and so i keep that positive outlook because if i ever veer off from a positive outlook i know where it's going to be and that's going to be back in the self-sabotage and self-destruction oh. world you know and once i if i get to that point I, it scares me to ever get to that point. And I think that that's what keeps me on the positive, you know, forefront is yeah, yeah. I'm scared to go back to that because I'm scared of the overdoses that I've had in my life. And I'm scared that, um, you know, a very good friend of ours just several months ago was doing great, um, leading CR groups and, um, and Bond used one last time, and you know, RJ, he had to go how home. many? And I know you can't give an exact answer, ballpark. How many friends you've lost to uh, addiction, be it alcohol or drugs, or you know, related yeah. to that? Yeah, just a ballpark. Um, I would say, you know, the funny thing is, is that I was just speaking to a high school friend not too long ago, and um, we started looking back at the people that are left not the people that's gone because it's wow. so it, the, the list is shorter of how many of us that are left. And it's, um, it's a very short list, unfortunately, so you know, you've lost a way too many regardless yeah. of one's too many. We get that. Yeah. But when it's over and over and over. Yeah. yeah it's like, yeah. it's like a continuing, uh, revolving door. And it's, um, unfortunately when COVID hit, obviously our numbers went up. You know, and isolation that's yeah. deadly to someone in addiction. Right. And we were very fortunate as Brianna's Hope, um, as we all came together and was like, how do we still get these meetings to people? And at the time I was leading the meeting here in, in Portland and we all started doing these Zoom meetings. So that I think that that really helped our Brianna's Hope numbers not fall like, you know, and I'm not saying that we have to have high numbers to be 
Um, but so you great. be effective in reaching people. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So the yeah. more higher our number is, the more people we're able to help. And um, we lost that as a whole in recovery with the COVID. But um, I would say that my life today, back to what you asked me, would be great. Like, I love my life. I love where I'm at. I look down this, um, what you would call the hilltop, and I'm grateful from where I was. Because if I wouldn't have went through all that, I wouldn't be able to sit here today to reach other people. I wouldn't know or have the education that I have about this. Um, so I'm grateful, and I, I am. You Hooray know. for you, and we're thankful for that. As you know, the, the name of our podcast is Faith in Your Recovery. I oftentimes like to ask our guests to, to define that in their words, what that title means to you. So it means a couple different things, right? Sure. Because we have to have, um, in my eyes, um, I know there's uh, people that would disagree, but we have to have faith with the Lord in order to keep going on this path to recovery. And we also have to have faith that recovery works, right? So there's a couple different meanings behind that. So I, I have faith in recovery working because I've seen it work. i seen it with my own two eyes, not just myself, so many people sitting at my meeting on Thursday night in Portland that, or in Wednesday night in Decatur, and I, that list can go on. I've been to about 13 of our Brianna's Hope chapters, but um, that has went to recovery or rehab and came back and that are leading Brianna's Hope meetings now you know so i've seen it work so i have that faith in recovery and i've always had my faith in the lord so faith in recovery means two different things i have to have god and i have to know that recovery works and uh, yeah you just testified to the proof of both and uh, we've got to have faith in our journey we you know that yeah. list goes on and uh, thank you thank you for that answer anything you want to close with here rj um no i, I mean i appreciate that i've been able to the listeners that are listening that have sat through this, you know, and heard, I hope we touch somebody with this. And I hope that, you know, somebody can either reach out to a support, whether it be you or anybody, um, and try to get that guidance. And I just appreciate that for you having me. Absolutely. We welcome. We're so thankful for your willingness to open up. Stories not easy to tell, but it's important to tell for yourself as well as for others. So, folks, thanks once again for joining us today on Faith in Your Recovery. We'll hope that you'll, uh, you know, you go ahead and download this, subscribe, help us out, support us. That's your way of clapping or, uh, you know, saying an amen. We look forward to the next time. God bless. Stay in the battle.